Hello YouTube! I recently did a video examining Max Stirner's egoism, in particular the concept of ownness. Uh, today we're going to turn to Stirner's political philosophy. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous video, I recommend watching it. Uh, I take ownness to be the, the heart of Stirner's ideas. Uh, I think his other views flow from this concept of ownness, so this video will probably make more sense if you've seen the previous one. Um, anyway, today we're going to examine more carefully Stirner's anarchism. Um, the ego in its own is often considered one of the foundational texts of uh, modern anarchism, um, and the anarchist tradition is where Stirner had the most influence. So, first of all, what exactly is meant by anarchism? Well, there are different types of anarchism, and uh, here I'm drawing on David Leopold's taxonomy of anarchism from his article Max Stirner's Anarchism. So, first, there are negative and positive aspects of anarchism. The negative part concerns the institutions that anarchists reject, and this is of course primarily the state. Uh, broadly speaking, we can define anarchism as the rejection of the state. Anarchists are opposed to the state in all its forms. More narrow conceptions of anarchism might take it to reject capitalism, hierarchy, authority, and so on more generally. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we're going to assume the broad definition, so we'll take anarchism to be the view that the state is illegitimate. There may also be a positive part of anarchism. The positive part is a proposal for how society might be organised instead, the preferred kinds of social organisations. Uh, positive visions for an anarchist society are often classified as either individualist or collectivist. Individualists tend to be more in favour of free markets, they tend to emphasise uh, the power of spontaneous order, they tend to be strongly against tradition. Uh, collectivists, on the other hand, uh, they think that order should be maintained more through strong communal ties and strong traditions, uh, and so on. Now this is of course a massive simplification, but the point is there there is quite a lot of variety in the positive visions that anarchists propose. Um, so, two further important distinctions that are made in the literature are between a priori and a posteriori anarchism and strong and weak anarchism. So first of all, a priori or a posteriori anarchism. Well, according to a priori anarchism, all possible states are illegitimate. There is some essential property of a state that renders it morally illegitimate. There could not be, even in principle, a morally legitimate state, no matter how the state arose, no matter how society is organised. A posteriori anarchism, by contrast, holds that all states that have actually existed are illegitimate, but in principle there might be a legitimate state. Now it's important to note that a posteriori anarchists need not actually endorse the construction of, stu of such a state. Perhaps it would be easier or safer to build an anarchist system than it would be for uh, a state to be organised in a legitimate way. But the point is, it's not impossible in principle. For example, somebody might hold that a state is legitimate only if all citizens explicitly consent to its existence and explicitly endorse all of its laws. Well, there never has been and probably never will be any state like this, but it's not logically contradictory. Okay, strong versus weak anarchism. Strong anarchism holds that given the illegitimacy of the state, we have a positive moral obligation to oppose it and attempt to eliminate it. We ought to act so as to bring about a stateless society. We ought to engage in some degree of political activism. So strong anarchism is explicitly a political movement. Weak anarchism, sometimes called philosophical anarchism, holds that since the state is illegitimate, individuals have no good reason to obey the state, but uh, weak anarchists deny that there is any obligation to bring about a stateless society. Indeed, a weak anarchist may not even particularly desire the elimination of the state. Maybe they think that the social conditions are not yet right for realising anarchy, or whatever. Um, so that gives us an initial characterisation of the space of anarchist views. Where exactly then does Stirner lie? Well, it's pretty evident that Stirner endorses the negative aspect of anarchism, uh, the rejection of the state. Uh, furthermore, Stirner is clearly an a priori anarchist. For Stirner, all possible states are illegitimate. Um, uh, and it should also be obvious from the previous video that Stirner is a weak anarchist. We'll examine all of these points in more detail as we go through this video. 
Now, Stoner gives um, various arguments against the political institutions of his day, uh, and his, his conclusions apply quite broadly. So uh, we'll take a look at Stoner's critique of uh, liberalism and socialism, uh, and then we'll consider the state more generally, and uh, finally we'll consider the distinction between strong and weak anarchism. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's turn to Stoner's critique of liberalism. Uh, now, first of all, a, a terminological point. Um, for Stoner, liberalism includes what he calls social liberalism, which in other words is socialism or communism. Stoner sees socialism and communism as basically extensions of the liberal tradition rather than, rather than as being fundamentally in opposition to it. Um, now, just because the terminology is fairly fixed these days, I'm going to talk about socialism rather than social liberalism. Um, but as I uh, explain Stoner's attacks on liberalism and socialism, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, for, you know, from his point of view, he's kind of he's he's talking about a tradition that he sees he sees a lot of continuity in. Um, okay, so we'll begin with what Stoner calls political liberalism, which is basically classical liberalism of the sort associated with John Locke and Adam Smith. So the liberal state uh, treats all individuals as citizens and grants all individuals equal rights. Uh, and this is opposed to the arbitrary hierarchies and privileges of the feudal order. In the liberal state, power and authority cannot legitimately be held merely on the basis of birthright or religious proclamation or anything like that. Uh, liberalism stands against aristocracy and religious domination. This is part of the mythology of liberalism. The story goes that in constructing, constructing democracy and affirming the equal rights of all citizens, liberalism has freed individuals from uh, religious authority and from domination by other persons. Liberalism holds that no particular person or group has the right to give orders or command others. So the church, for example, cannot command my allegiance. I have the liberty to enter or leave as I see fit. Uh, I have the freedom to pursue whatever uh, religion I wish. Uh, I cannot be commanded to follow a particular religion. Similarly, a landowner may not command me to work for him. I'm not held in serfdom. I can work or refuse to work for whoever I choose. Nobody then may issue any absolute commands to me. Except, of course, the state itself. Um, the liberal state claims a monopoly on the use of, of force. Uh, it, it, the liberal state is the only institution that may issue absolute commands. And since the state has this, this absolute power, nothing is justified without the warrant of the state. So the state has various rights that it might confer upon the citizens, such as the right to lead a battalion, the right to uh, lead a company, the right to teach, the right to practice medicine. Uh, for the liberal state, it makes no difference who gets what rights, provided each person fulfills the duties associated with the post. And this is what equality of political rights really amounts to. The state takes all individuals as, as men, as citizens, and it's unconcerned with any of their other qualities. So what this means is that the state no longer recognises any other authority. It no longer needs to give special consideration to the man who is an aristocrat or to the nobleman's son or whatever. The state has absolute and direct authority over every individual. Now, as Stirner sees it, while liberalism has indeed freed people from subjugation to other persons. Um, it has indeed ended the servitude to a particular religion, servitude to you know, an aristocrat, a nobleman, whatever. Um, it still demands subjugation to the absolute state. Um, it is the role of the state to grant rights and permissions. People are free only in the sense that the state takes them all only as men, all as exemplifying the essence of man. With political liberalism, the uh, thousand little lords of feudalism that claimed the right to command other individuals, you know, the, the guilds, the nobilities, the priesthoods and so on of the feudal system, all of these are replaced by the absolute state. So political liberty for the liberal, what this really amounts to is 
that we are no longer separated from the state by any intermediaries. Um, the state has direct power over all of the individual citizens. So this is a particularly striking example of the point made in the previous video about how every new freedom brings with it a new domination. Now a central aspect of uh, the mythology of liberalism concerns its promotion of the free market or free competition as Sterner calls it. Uh, so the mythology is that the state simply oversees the market in a neutral and disinterested way. It doesn't constrain the economic activity of the citizens uh, and the prices of goods and services arise simply from supply and demand. Uh, the role of the state is just to ensure that contracts are upheld, that nobody engages in theft or fraud. I mean, this can perhaps be seen as just one aspect of the liberal idea of equal rights, because the point is that in a free market, nobody is barred from com competing. Nobody has any special privileges granted to them by the state, at, at least not in virtue of arbitrary characteristics like birthright. Uh, all people may compete, all people may attempt to advance up the social ladder. This is in sharp contrast to feudalism, where markets were more strongly con controlled, rights to open businesses were curtailed, uh, and so on. The liberal ideal is that through free competition, those who best fulfill the wishes of their customers will succeed. So you know, the, the free market is at heart a meritocracy, which will produce the best outcome for all. Everyone can enter, and those who provide the best services will have the most success. Now, Stoner raises various objections to this liberal mythology in his book. Um, here I will mention three. Uh, first, the state determines who can enter into particular market transactions by specifying who can serve in particular occupations. So I wouldn't be able to just start operating as a doctor selling medical services. Uh, for many industries, I must present the appropriate qualifications. In the liberal state, Permissions are not granted on the basis of what are seen as arbitrary factors, but the state still does grant permissions. The state uh, still does enforce certain requirements for particular occupations, and it does specify exactly what can be exchanged on the market. So in this way, the state erects a thousand barriers, as Sterner puts it, within the market. Um, and I mean, you know, if anything, this point is maybe more pertinent in, in the modern world. Markets are controlled through occupational licensing, zoning laws, border controls, laws against the exchange of particular goods like drug laws. Um, so, you know, this is one way in which the idea that the state, in the idea that, that we have a free market, that the state uh, does not re you know, regulate the, uh, the economic activity of the citizens is, is a myth. Um, second, and more importantly, in order to engage in any kind of market activity, you must use your resources, your property. But the state determines the property laws and enforces a particular system of property rights. Liberal society consists not simply of people asserting ownership of things, uh, however they wish. Rather, we take particular ownership relations as being legitimate, as designating property, by virtue of the laws of the state. Let's say that a successful manufacturer is considered the owner of several factories. Well, part of what makes him the owner of these factories is that the state has de determined certain property distributions to be legitimate. Um, so, for example, the factories were owned by his father, who voluntarily transferred them to him, and this is taken as a legitimate way to transfer property. And the state is prepared to back this up with force. So. The workers at a factory could not legitimately compete uh, with the manufacturer by claiming the factory is their own and using it for their own devices. No, the state would back up the manufacturer and would escalate force almost indefinitely until the, uh, the insurrection is crushed. Those who own resources do so through legal title protected by the state. Um, if the power of the state were broken, different people would gain. Stirner, Stirner thinks the labourers would gain. Uh, as Stirner puts it, the non-possessor will regard the state as a power protecting the possessor. Um, now, labourers, of course, have protection from the state also, but only as subjects of the state, not as labourers. 
because the state recognises each person only as a citizen. So it would be against the law to kill a labourer, for instance. It would also be against the law to deprive the labourer of the meagre property that he does, in fact, have. Um, but these same rights that are granted to the labourer are used as a tool for his oppression in enforcing inequalities um, and in preventing him from, for example, just taking the factory as his own. Uh, this leads to a third point, that the idea of free competition is illusory for those who do not have sufficient resources to compete. Uh, recall the point made in the previous video about the problem with the concept of freedom in general. Well, what the liberal state provides is a freedom from some specific kinds of state intervention in the market. If a person does not have uh, sufficient productive property, then obviously they can't compete, or at the very least the deck will be heavily stacked against them. Now, possession of property is the result of arbitrary factors. Um, much property acquisition occurs through inheritance. So if you happen to be lucky enough to, born, to be born into a wealthy family, you're in a much better position to compete on the market. Furthermore, even those who begin from a relatively similar position may just have different luck um, in, the, in the hunt for customers, in the search for work, uh, in the conditions of the community in which their business is based. A natural disaster might destroy one business while leaving another intact. So contrary to the image of meritocracy, success in the liberal market is often a result not of hard work and competence and other virtues, but of arbitrary factors like luck of birth and fortuity of circumstances. And then the people who have success, right, that is protected through the force of the state. So there is a, a tension at the heart of liberalism. Uh, the liberals were motivated by the desire to remove arbitrary privileges, and so they affirmed equality of rights, where the state treats all as equal citizens, and only the state has the power to command. And the people are thereby liberated from the, uh, the thousand little lords. But the system of private property enforced by the state gives those who possess it power over the lives of others, and in practice, free competition just means that those who possess um, sufficient property are free to use that power as they see fit. Uh, equality of rights is an, an empty equality, when in practice arbitrary privilege remains due to the inequalities in resources. So this uh, tension at the heart of political liberalism leads to what Stirner calls social, liber social liberalism. Um, or what we would call socialism or communism. So let's turn to that. The socialist uh, then recognises that private property introduces inequalities. Um, and uh, as, as we've just argued, this appears to be an arbitrary hierarchy, an arbitrary privilege. Once people see that political liberalism, no less than the old feudalism, involves the state granting arbitrary privileges, they begin to demand not just equality of political rights, but also social and economic equality. Uh, in particular, the socialist responds to class inequality by pro proposing an alternative account of resource ownership. Under socialism, private property is abolished and ownership of property is transferred to society as a whole, with the benefits of that property being distributed equally. Um, incidentally, it's worth bearing in mind that Stoner was writing in the, the 1840s. Uh, there have been quite a lot of developments in socialist theory since that time. So, you know, you're not going to find a critique of Marxism here because Marxism uh, wasn't a thing when Stoner was writing. So it's, it's you know, just worth, worth keeping in mind that, um, you know, the time period. Um, anyway, Stoner's exemplar of socialism is Pierre-Joseph Proudhon which I, I may not be pronouncing correctly, but anyway, Proudhon argues that there is no legitimate basis for a person to claim ownership of land. Uh, all attempts to justify property rights in land, such as natural right, universal consent, first occupancy or whatever, they all fail. What's more, property rights in land allow the proprietor to extract profit through rent, while the proprietor need not labour at all. Um, you know, just the mere ownership of that land is what gives them the ability to do that. So you know, the, the mere ownership is all she needs to, to extract the profit. So there's a, a transfer of wealth to the proprietor, even though this person is not actually creating any good for society. 
Uh, so the legal fiction of property right, a concept without any good justification, is used by the few to extract a profit from the many. Hence, as Proudhon famously put it, property is theft. So Proudhon argues that property should be socialised. Individuals would no longer own property but simply use it. Uh, the, the, you know, land as a whole would belong to society. In a socialist society then, people are no longer dependent on fortune. People are freed from privileges bestowed by inheritance. They're freed from the vicissitudes of life in an unregulated market. They're freed from poverty, freed from want. But this freedom brings with it a total subjugation of the individual to society. While liberalism grants the state a monopoly on force, socialism grants society ownership of property. Neither the use of force nor the possession of property is permitted to the individual. The socialist conception of freedom is achieved only when all individuals are deprived of command, of property, of resources. Everyone is dispossessed of everything, so everyone is reduced to the status of what Sterner calls the ragamuffin. Uh, um, but you know, the socialist sees this as liberty because we are all ragamuffins together. Um, it, you know, in the same way as we're all equally citizens in liberalism, so we are all equally ragamuffins in, so in socialism. The socialist society provides me with what I need. Um, in, indeed, in socialism only society is capable of meeting my needs because both command and property have been taken from me. Um, but since the society is my provider, I am therefore under an obligation to serve it in turn. Uh, our equality consists not just in us being equal citizens of the state, but in us existing for each other. We all exist for each other. We all help each other and all labour for each other. It's your labour that is your value, and others owe you a recompense for your labour, just as you owe a recompense to others for their labour. Socialism thereby presses all individuals into greater dependence on each other. As Sterner puts it, and I quote, Communism rightly revolts against the pressure that I experience from individual proprietors, but still more horrible is the might that it puts in the hands of the collectivity. Recall the discussion of reification in the previous video. Well, in Stunner's view, in the hands of socialists, society is a reified abstraction. Uh, now, of course, Stunner agrees with the negative critique of the, the justification of liberal property rights. Uh, there is no way to, to justify liberal property rights morally. Um, would it then follow, as Proudhon put it, that property is theft? Well, no. Um, as Sterner points out, the concept of theft requires a prior concept of property. If we're talking about theft, then we must suppose that there is some property with some particular owner available to steal. Um, a piece of land that belongs to nobody cannot be stolen. So, of course, socialists do not reject property. Um, they only reject the liberal account of property rights. While the liberal grants property rights to particular individuals, the socialist takes society as a whole, or maybe humanity as a whole, or whatever, as the owner of property. Property is owned by all, used for the benefit of all. And so it is a theft from society as a whole for one person to be granted exclusive rights to, one land, to, to some land. Society is the possessor. Society has the property rights. Society is the owner. And to think of society in this way is to reify an abstraction. Society is nothing but a collection of individuals. Society doesn't have any particular desires or goals or ownness. It therefore makes no sense to say that it can own anything, uh, nor that it can give or bestow or grant property or permissions. Um, what you receive from society, you always receive from some particular specific individual. Uh, so you know, in in socialising property, we would not be granting any genuine entity. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be granting the entity of society ownership of property. We would simply be taking property from one person and giving it to another. And of course, Sterner has no objection to this. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't object to taking property from one person and giving it to another. What he objects to is that the socialist treats society as a whole as if it were a separate person. Um, kind of over and above any particular individual people, 
um, and that this person, this society, provides us all with what we have and we all owe it allegiance. The socialist sees every individual only in terms of how they can serve this abstract society. Um, so it is, it involves a, a subjugation of the individual to, to society. Now, in contrast to both liberalism and socialism, Stirner affirms a thoroughly egoistic conception of property, uh, which basically amounts to property is what is mine. Um, so as, as Stirner says, my property is nothing but what is in my power. I give myself the right of property in taking property to myself. Uh, this is, of course, just an application of Stirner's general position that there are no moral rights. There is only you know, what you exercise power over. Uh, my property is just what I, in fact, control, what I, in fact, exercise power over. So egoistic property is, uh, as Stirner puts it, a war of all against all. You do not wait for society or the state or anything else to bestow entitlements upon you. Rather, you simply seize what you need. The property that you take for yourself and that you're able to control is uh, an element or expression of your individual autonomy, your individual capacity, your ownness. Others may, of course, take the property from, from you, and if they're successful, it becomes their property. Uh, recall Stunner's example from the previous video that if somebody cuts off my leg, then what they take is a leg, not my leg, right? Like, it's, it's the same with all of the other objects um, that I own. Right, the minute something is taken from me and is no longer in my power, it's not mine anymore. Um, like, and that's that's that, right? What what is yours? What is your property? Is just a matter of what you can control. And um, actually, as that uh, leg example also illustrates, an important aspect of Stirner's account of property is that, although for for uh, Proudhon and for many other socialists, their objections are specifically to property rights over land, for Stirner. Your property is literally anything that you can control, including land, objects, people, even your own thoughts and desires. Um, you know, as far as I can tell, Stoner doesn't really see any fundamental distinction between different types of property. Anything that you might assert power over is your property. Other accounts of property are moralized. Um, they provide rules for determining who has a legitimate right over a particular object. So if I received uh, the object through a voluntary transaction from somebody who created the object from raw materials that they found in their garden, for example, uh, then on most accounts of, of property, I have a right to that object. Stirner, of course, simply rejects this completely. If somebody has taken your belongings from you and you have no means of getting them back, Stirner thinks it's just absurd and pointless to assert that those things remain your property. Um, in saying that your property is what you have power over, Stirner, Stirner is giving a descriptive, not a normative account of property relations. In practice, property is simply a matter of possession, backed up by might and force. There is no moral right to property. There is no obligation on anybody to respect any particular property uh, relations. And this conception of property really brings into focus the domination of the individual by the state in liberalism and socialism. Private property, as it's standardly conceived, doesn't actually correspond to what is yours, to what you exercise power over. So private property isn't really property, um, at least on Stirner's view. Let's say that I assert that this field is mine. Um, I, I have a right to this field or whatever. Um, and, and let's say that this is indeed backed up by like legal title. Well, under present circumstances, the power over the field actually comes from the state. The state takes itself to have the duty to protect my title to the field. So, you know, I will call upon the state uh, if my field is threatened. Uh, and furthermore, should the state decide that I actually don't have a title to the field, it will forcibly remove me. So in fact, where the state enforces particular property rights, you know, what, what we call my property right to the field, it's really the state's property, which the state is permitting me to use. So 
it turns out there really isn't so much difference between liberalism and socialism after all. Liberalism has this mythology of rights and freedoms which is framed as limiting the power of the state, but in fact in enforcing property rights the state brings all individuals under its fold and asserts ownership of everything there is. Socialism simply makes this explicit and then it it, it favours putting the state's ownership of everything to a different purpose. Um, but you know, either way there can be no property that is genuinely mine under the dominion of the state. Um, individual property requires the absence of a state. So we're, we, you know, we're presented with these, these two alternatives. Under liberal capitalism, the state enforces a system of property rights that um, you know, benefits a particular group of people. Uh, in this system, you have nothing without the assent of the state. Therefore, you don't really own any property. You only hold it through a temporary permission. Under socialism, the state is quite open about the fact that it owns all property on behalf of all of society and it redistributes the resources equitably, equitably for all. But in neither case have, you know, have, have we achieved greater liberty right, in, in any general sense. Um, and certainly in both cases, there is a subjugation of the individual to the state. Both liberalism and socialism demand the subjugation of the individual to the state. And so this brings us to Stirner's status as an anarchist. Um, clearly, Stirner's critique of liberalism and socialism also provides a critique of states quite generally, um, but it's uh, you know, worth explicitly stating the fundamental problem with the state, uh, according to Stirner. So all states affirm a right of command. All states have what Stirner calls supreme might. Um, which I take to refer to how all states will claim um, you know, the, the, the right to use force, that states claim a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. The only violence that is acceptable to the state is violence that it permits. Now, if this supreme might is granted to a single individual, then you have a monarchy or a dictatorship or something. If it's distributed among society as a whole, then you have a democracy. But in either case, the might of the state is applied against the individual. The claim of monopoly on force allows a distinction to be drawn between laws and arbitrary orders. Uh, this is the distinction between the violence of the state and the violence of a criminal, like a mugger. So when the state forcibly expels a group of squatters who are occupying a field of a rich landowner, this is an application of the law. When a man in the street forcibly takes some possessions from another, that's a crime. Uh, laws issue from the states and are imbued with political authority. Obviously, Stirner rejects this. Uh, for the egoist, what's happening in both of those cases is simply the forcible transfer of property from one person to another. Um, and you know, f from the egoist point of view, the impact on the individual of any law or order is the same, regardless of its provenance. Whether it comes from the state or from a mugger, I recognise only that there is an external force that is preventing me from doing what I want to do, um, whether that be sit in a field or, um, you know, hold on to these pieces of jewellery. To recognise certain orders as legitimate laws, which one has a duty to obey, this is fundamentally incompatible with self-mastery. For the egoist, nothing can make a law legitimate. Um, not the consent of the governed, not the positive consequences of having the law, nothing. Even if I gave myself a law to follow, I could in the next moment refuse to obey it. If I come into conflict with the law, that's just one command among many that is contrary to my own interest. Um, so as Stoner says, no one has any business to command my actions, to say what course I shall pursue and to set up a code to govern it. Um, I, and that, that nobody, that includes indeed myself, as we discussed in the previous video, I should not feel beholden to the commands that I placed upon myself in the past. In the face of any obligation, I assert my ownness. My ownness recognises no binding duties, no obligations. My will cannot be restricted, not even by myself. So, you know, it doesn't really even need to be said that th this kind of position is utterly incompatible with all of the standard justifications that have been given for the existence of a state. Even in the ideal situation where all people explicitly consent to a state and all of its rules, um, the state will remain without legitimacy. 
the law, the state, is straightforwardly opposed to self-mastery. Uh, the state and the individual are, as Stoner says, irreconcilable enemies. The individual who affirms his ownness recognises no other master, but this is precisely the role assumed by the state. Uh, and the precise form of the state makes no difference to this point. Every state is a despotism. So quite clearly then, in our taxonomy of anarchist positions, Stirner is an a priori anarchist. No state, even in principle, can be recognised as legitimate by the egoist. Uh, that leaves two questions. What does Stirner propose as a foundation for stateless society? You know, what is Stirner's positive vision? Um, and secondly, how should we behave towards the state? In terms of Stirner's positive vision then, well, obviously Stirner's critique of the state applies uh, much more broadly than to the state alone. Uh, indeed, Stirner rejects not simply the state, but almost all social institutions as they currently exist. Family, church, employment, educational institutions, exchange on the market, all of these are going to be either abolished or radically transformed uh, in, a, in a society of egoists. I mean, it's worth noting, um, you know, we've, we've already seen that Stirner objects to Proudhon for his socialist account of property, but Proudhon was, of course, an anarchist also. Um, so, you know, Stirner certainly goes beyond merely the negative part of anarchism, and there are some pretty significant differences between Stirner's anarchism and uh, other forms of anarchism that you can find in the literature. Anyway, Stirner envisions a society of individuals who serve only themselves um, and who resist subjugation to abstractions such as society, humanity, God, and so on. Stirner suggests that the unit of social organisation will become what he calls the union of egoists. A union of egoists is a temporary collection of people who are cooperatively interacting, each for the benefit of herself and with none of them taking themselves to have any binding obligations to the others. Um, in a later article called Stirner's Critics, Stirner gives a couple of examples of egoistic union. Uh, first, he says, consider uh, children come across each other outside and begin playing, each enjoying the game while it lasts. Second, a man bumps into his friends and goes out to drinks with them. Some fairly simple examples there, but they illustrate the point. Uh, in neither case is the interaction based on a sense of obligation or loyalty or sacrifice. The children taking part in the game and the man going out for drinks, they act as they do out of an expectation of pleasurable experience. Egoistic union is any kind of cooperative interaction where the participants do not see themselves as, as acting out of obligation. I choose to enter the union and I may choose to leave as it benefits me to do so. And what this means is that I can take the union as my creation, as my possession, my property, as an instrument that I can use to my own ends that I have brought into being and that I can destroy when it ceases to serve me. Uh, there may continue to be a union without me, but there could not be this particular union without me. Like once I've entered into a union that so, you know, if there's a group of people cooperatively interacting and then I join in, um, that's going to change uh, the, the interaction. Similarly, when I leave, that's going to change the interaction. So I can view, I take the union as my own, um, not as something that I see as imposed upon me by others. Um, and, it, I mean, it's important to note that Stirner is using the phrase union of egoists in a very broad way to refer to all kinds of cooperative interactions. Um, we must be careful not to reify any particular union, right? A union of egoists doesn't exist apart from the interactions of the people involved. There is no overall goal of a union. It has no final end. It has no essence. Each person involved remains wholly independent, pursuing their own interests. Um, and it's also important to note that Stirner does not argue that we ought to construct unions of egoists or anything like that. Um, I mean, th th this is this is basically a descriptive claim, right? Such unions are constantly popping in and out of existence at various scales of society, right? People already do form unions of egoists when they act cooperatively in their own self-interest. Um, and the point being made here is that this is just how an egoist society would in fact be structured, right? Like if people, if everybody became an egoist, right, what you would end up with is a society where there are uh, where social structure arises from unions of egoists. 
Um, there's no normative force to this. Sterner isn't saying that this is how people ought to live. So uh, anyway, the, the, the point here, though, is that there is uh, space for human relationships to flourish under egoism. Um, you know, egoism is not going to be a, 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 a lonely uh, world where you only kind of think of yourself. Um, you, you are going to be interacting with others. Having said that, um, it is obvious that a world, a world of egoists would look radically different. And perhaps the best example of this can be found in Stirner's discussion of love. An egoistic union could never be one based on romantic love. Romantic love involves a sense of obligation to another person, which requires you to sacrifice yourself for the sake of that other person, or at least sacrifice some of your interests for the sake of that other person. In this respect, the object of your love possesses you. You act for the object of your love, not for yourself. Stunner, in fact, says that the smallest speck of obligation to another is possessedness. Right, that, that, that's to allow yourself to be possessed by the other. In egoistic love, by contrast, we take others as our property. Stirner says, and I quote, My love is my own only when it consists in a selfish and egoistic interest, and when the object of my love is really my object or my property. You don't owe anything to your property, and when you care for your property, you do so because of how it benefits you. If the object of your love changes and so stops benefiting you, say maybe maybe the person you love becomes terribly ill or something and you think actually that's that's not really providing me with any benefits anymore, well you should simply replace them with somebody else. Um, in general, the egoist sacrifices nothing to society but merely utilises it. She treats society, she treats all other people as hers to do with as she pleases. Um, Sterner makes this very explicit. I quote, We have only one relation to each other, that of usableness, of utility, of use. We owe each other nothing. For what I seem to owe you, I owe at most to myself. Um, so yeah, uh, one point here is that uh, the, the, the world of egoists, the egoistic future that Sterner envisions is, um, uh, you know, quite some people might find quite quite disturbing, right? There, there are going to be some pretty radical changes if if people did in fact become egoists. Um, and another point that follows from all of this is that although the state is fundamentally illegitimate, Stirner does not suppose that people have any obligation or even necessarily any reason at all to attempt to abolish the state. So in terms of strong versus weak anarchism, Stirner is only a weak anarchist. The egoist simply rejects the state. Um, so she does not recognise it as having any authority over her, but she doesn't uh, accept that any other group or principle or idea uh, or, or anything else has any authority over her either. She acts only for herself. What Stunner says is that, um, in practice, if enough people were to embrace egoism, then the state would collapse. But egoist opposition to the state is through insurrection rather than revolution. A revolution involves a particular political group opposing the current establishment and attempting to bring about a new social arrangement. It involves the coordinated activity of perhaps hundreds of thousands of people. All of these people affirm allegiance to an identity, say the proletariat or the sans culot, and they attempt to liberate this from this abstraction from oppressive conditions. But as we've seen, on, on Stirner's view, any new freedom, freedom for the proletariat, freedom for the sans culotte, whatever, any new freedom brings with it a new dominion which will subjugate the individual. Revolution takes place under the dominion of an abstraction that, and individuals are expected to submit to the cause. By contrast, in insurrection, you simply withdraw your support from the state. You refuse to seek the state's approval. You evade the state where its commands conflict with your will. Uh, the insurgent walks her own way. Insurrection has no particular demand, uh, there's no particular new vision for overall social organisation. Um, insurrection occurs when individuals affirm their ownness against the constraints imposed by the state. While the, revolution, the revolutionary demands a new constitution, the insurgent seeks to become constitutionless. Um, and of course, that's why 
you shouldn't see the union of egoists thing as uh, you know being Stirner's claim for how society ought to be organised or anything like that. Um, anyway, Stirner rejects all political movements, um, including anarchism, insofar as these would demand sacrifice of the individual for the sake of realising the political goal. The egoist recognises no higher calling. She simply lives herself out without any regard for how well humanity fares as a result. A society of egoists would be a society without a state because nobody would recognise any higher authority and uh, a command can have no force if nobody obeys it. Um, but Stoner's anarchism doesn't really translate into support for organised political activism except where involvement in such activities is of use to the individual herself. So that is Stoner and that's Stoner's anarchism. Um, hope you found that interesting. That is all. Goodbye. <laughs>